On July 3rd, I went on the Pickett's Charge Battle Walk, led by Ranger Matt Atkinson. I've posted excerpts of the talk along with some maps and photos to help visualize the situation. This video will probably be one of two covering the walk. The Park Service estimated over 300 people on the Battle Walk. That is an interesting number, as the average number of men in the infantry regiments at Gettysburg was 274. I did want to record more footage, uh, but somebody left his spare GoPro batteries in the car. Sergeant Barnes was not happy. And the next some bitch I could catch leaving batteries in their car. I'm personally going to take an interest in seeing them suffer. Tombstone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot you were there. You may go now. <laughs> That's my favorite movie he did, Tombstone. Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. You may go now. He had heard of God, but here was General Lee. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mississippi. Hey, how are you? Winston Salem. I heard you were coming in on a sedan chair. Oh, he's you take him away. The man who wouldn't put out the cigarette. I like you. <laughs> you what tour that was? Wasn't that here? Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was criminal category. 102 degrees. 102 degrees? 102 degrees. Yeah. Y'all think I ought to use this or my voice? Use that. Use that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank y'all for all coming. I really appreciate it. You don't have to rush up here. I'm not going to talk, all right? <laughs> uh, yeah. We're going to do the uh, seven mode. He didn't work. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Does everybody here know that you're our favorite ranger? Not all of us, but everybody else. What, you want to get cut in that? You can hear it. It's in it really well. It's very funny. You need a bike? But these are super knowledgeable. I told you about it. Pity up, boys. It's going to be a long, hot walk. There'll be plenty of time for fighting. You're ready, sir. Put the flags on the trees. I'd like to welcome everybody to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Matt Atkinson. I'm from Houston, Mississippi, which is about 30 miles below Tupelo. A little small town. If you ever watched the movie The Horse Soldiers with John Wayne, mm -hmm. and you gotta be paying attention, but in the very beginning of that movie, he looks down at the map. Not even, the camera's not even on John Wayne, but he looks down the map and he points with his finger. I don't even think they may say it, but his finger points at. Houston, Mississippi. <laughs> Cross at LaGrange, down through Ripley, New Albany, Houston. Is there something wrong, sir? I know the map, Colonel. Proceed. John Wayne. <laughs> yep. And Elvis played there in 1955. <laughs> Somebody was asking me earlier about Zach Wilde playing that guitar solo in front of me, and that piece of sweat hit me that night at the concert. There was, Elvis was not famous, nationally. And you could walk up. There was no dressing room. There was nothing like that. And there are all these pictures of these teenage girls. They're, of course, older now, much older now, since 2021. With their arms, with Elvis with their arms around. Well, anyway, Elvis signed one of the, my, my, so, my study hall teacher's arms. I said, you didn't get anything permanent. She goes, we weren't thinking. <laughs> I didn't wash my arm for a month until <laughs> it completely faded. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but <laughs> yeah, you know. So what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to do the planning. Uh, first of all, we're going to do the planning for Pickett's Charge. And let's just be honest here, okay? Uh, I've got approximately 300 people here. 
And I know a lot of you are used to the videos and, and you like that format and everything, but we just basically have too many people to try to get off into that tactical minutia. In other words, I'm telling you hardcore Gettysburg buffs that we have a lot of Americans here that are on this walk for the first time. And if I get off into the minutia, into the weeds with this stuff, mm. what kind of experience is that for them? So we call it a battle walk. Basically, I'm going to get you across the field. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of getting you across the field, uh, when we start out, we got Slash back there. All right. When we start across this field over here, we will have, if you have a medical emergency, we will have a four-wheeler or some type of vehicle, okay, uh, following behind the column. So if you, if you have an emergency, you walk backwards, not forward, to get help. They'll be happy to assist you uh, with whatever the needs are. All right, let's get into the program. Does anybody know who that gentleman is? Anybody dare say his name anymore? Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee. Robert e. Lee. That's right. When I, used to, uh, when I used to work in the old visitor center, some of you go back as far with me to remember that old visitor center, uh, the movie Gettysburg used to play in the background all the time, and I got to, I could hear the music, I couldn't see the television, but I got to learn that soundtrack so well that I eventually figured out which part of the soundtrack was leading up to that point where they cheer Lee. And I would, if the desk wasn't busy, I would always walk in there to watch those 30 seconds. <laughs> You can look it up on YouTube if you like, but that was always my favorite scene right there uh, from the movie. But more about the movie in just a minute. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee is here at the Battle of Gettysburg. And Robert E. Lee has a momentous decision in his hands at this moment. Robert E. Lee has been commanding this army for approximately 13 months. When Robert E. Lee takes command, most Southerners, soldiers, press, people, poo-pooed the idea of Robert E. Lee taking command because he was too conservative as far as his maneuvers and decisions and so forth. Lee comes out, he has an enemy army under George McClellan, enemy army in the Confederacy, and I'm talking from Lee's standpoint. And they're outside the gates of the Capitol. Robert E. Lee instantly at the end of June of 62 goes into an offensive and in a bloody series of assaults. Setting up Pickett's charge, he pushes back the Union Army. In the last battle of what is called the Seven Days Campaign, the Confederate infantry in July of 1862 charge up a hill called Malvern Hill, and they are slaughtered, those Confederates against the, into the teeth of that. It is 12 months later now, and Lee has fought the Second Battle of the Nashville. He's fought, he's fought Sharpsburg or Antietam, he's fought Fredericksburg, and he's fought Chancellorsville. Has he learned any lessons? from the battlefield yet. All right? So, we have to study that. Robert E. Lee wins the Battle of Chancellorsville, as I just said, in May of 63. And the question I want you to do, and with 300 people, this is my main objective today with you. I'm going to start, as I always do, with the big picture. We're going to work our, work our way around. But I want you, you, my fellow Americans, to put yourself in the shoes of these men on July 3rd of 1863 and ask yourself, if, as far as possible as you can, take a, a, a wipe and wipe the grease board clean, so to speak. Wipe your memory clean. We all know what's about to happen. It hasn't happened yet, as Faulkner once said. All right, there's still time. What would you do? Lee has fought all of those battles which I just said, which I just relate. He is still just thousands, look, thousands, thousands of people have been killed, wounded, and maimed. Why do you fight battles? What is the 
purpose of fighting battles? What is the ultimate objective? To win. win. To win. You know, it used to fight wars to win. Robert E. Lee, after the Battle of Chancellorsville, finally gets, finally gets the opportunity to take the initiative. If you watch poker, Robert E. Lee, if you were playing poker against Robert E. Lee, Lee wants to dictate the action in the hand. He wants his opponent reacting to him, not Lee reacting to his opponent. And so with that in mind, in a calculated gamble that Abraham Lincoln would be paranoid about saving Washington, D.C. and force that Union Army to follow him, Robert E. Lee takes on a desperate gamble. He will move the Confederate Army out in front of Richmond to the west into the Shenandoah Valley and basically take Interstate 81, future Interstate 81, <laughs> all the way up into this area. And then he spreads out all across and you know what that Union Army tells right after him. Robert E. Lee gets up here and as you well know, I don't need to rehash all of this, he is surprised to learn when he gets into Pennsylvania that suddenly the Union Army is a lot closer than he first thought it was. He assumed they were in Virginia. That's the whole debate within itself. Once he realizes that, he calls, uh, calls for a concentration of his troops in a little town called Gettysburg. The reason that he calls Gettysburg for the concentration point is it is the junction of ten roads from all different directions. Lee wants to go to Gettysburg and threaten Washington and Baltimore and make that Union Army. He thinks the Union Army is moving west, not north. He thinks they're moving west toward Hagerstown to get behind him. Lee doesn't want the enemy behind him. He wants them in front of him. So he comes to Gettysburg to lure that Union Army after him, but he doesn't know how close they are. The Union Army, on the other hand, wants to find Robert E. Lee. They've heard rumors. They've got some basically good intelligence that Lee is up by Harrisburg and over here by the mountains, but they're not exactly sure where they are. The Union Army needs to come to a central location and find out so they can go in different directions and find out where Robert E. Lee is. And so like a magnet, ladies and gentlemen, that road network is going to guide these two armies into Gettysburg. It's all about logistics. We're out here to do the bullets. This is the fun part, okay? But armies move by logistics, supplies. I know that's the boring stuff, but that's what Lee calculates. That's what an army commander does. He says to himself, if I mark Ewell's Corps 20 miles from here, where are they going to get water? Where are they going to resupply? How am I going to put the supply wagon away from the enemy? How do I protect them? Where are the route? It's just mind-boggling to think about an army in motion. As we well know, at 7.30 in the morning on July 1st, a simple march to Gettysburg is going to be broken by a gunshot. The first shot of the battle. And that kicks off a maelstrom. And basically, just like a barroom brawl, when they start fighting each other, they call for their friends. And just like everybody running in there, <laughs> they start to fighting it out. Long story short, July 1st ends in a Confederate victory. And I would like to say, we're sitting here studying, what would you do? What would you do? We are sitting here studying this. Robert E. Lee. I always say, with hindsight being 2020, I'm going to use a little bit of hindsight for my fact. The worst thing that ever happened to Robert E. Lee is he wins the first day. <laughs> That's the worst thing that ever happened because it sets up the rest of the battle. Out of seven Union Corps, he is outnumbered. He destroys two of those Union Corps on the first day. On the second day, he wants to follow it up. I could do. We, we've done programs on that, obviously, all over the park over the years. But on the second day, he comes very close and he gains ground. But he doesn't, he comes this close, but he doesn't win the battle. Now it's July 3rd. It's 1863. If you're Robert E. Lee. Oh, and the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg is one of the bloodiest in the Civil War. If you're Robert E. Lee, though, can you walk away from it? Why do you fight battle? To win. To win. You didn't come this far without trying one last attempt. And as E.P. Alexander, the Confederate colonel, said, 
we knew it was a desperate thing to attempt. But Lee had ordered it. And their belief, and that old man up there, their belief in that is just like when you saw Joe Montana coming out of the tunnel. <laughs> right? Or I hate to say I'm a Saints fan. When you see Drew Brees, when you saw Drew Brees. <laughs> Go Saints! Who that? <laughs> <laughs> you think you got a chance. Because you got a quarterback that can win. There's your quarterback. And Alexander said Lee had ordered it, so it must be all right. These men knew. These men knew. Robert E. Lee wrote in January of 1864, the result of the day's operations induced the belief that with proper concert of action and with the increased support that the positions gained on the right would enable, that's the right down there, would enable, would enable the artillery to render the assaulting columns assistance, we should ultimately succeed. And it was accordingly determined to continue the attack. The general plan was unchanged. Longstreet, reinforced by Pickett's three brigades, which arrived near the battlefield during the afternoon of the July 2nd, was ordered to attack the next morning, and General Ewell was directed to assail the enemy's right at the same time. Those three Virginia brigades comprised 5,300 infantry. That fluctuates. When I first got out here and did this program, it was 5,800. Then a couple of years later, it was 5,400. But in 2021, it's 5,300. So you'll have to tune in next time to see what this is. <laughs> Even harder, though, we, it would be, you know, you could get a, we can get a, a better sense of picket than we can anybody else, though, that's in this, in this attack. Why? Because the rest of the troops had already been in combat. And their losses are not calculated by day. They're calculated by the whole battle. So it's hard to break down. But the latest study of Pickett's charge estimates that the supporting infantry under Pettigrew, and they would not like me using the word support. <laughs> Woo, they probably fight me over that. 4,300 infantry under Fry, comprising the brigades of Fry, Marshall, Davis, and Brockenbrough. Backing them up, 1,700 North Carolinians. 1,700 under Isaac Tremont who was otherwise known as, by his troops as, you'll never learn this on the dressing got it her. His nickname was Aunt Nancy. What else would it be? <laughs> no? Y'all never heard that? And then, you've got support troops over here. We'll talk about a little bit later, if I remember, under Wilcox, Alabamians, and Lang's Viridians. So you have Virginians. You have Tennesseans. You have Alabamians, you have North Carolinians, you have Mississippians, all here on this field. Am I leaving anybody out? Florida. Florida. We don't forget the Floridians. <laughs> uh, it was my pleasure several years ago to, to work aside, alongside, I, not often, but I, I did meet her a couple of times. She worked in another building. But uh, we used to have, she retired, but we used to have a historian here named Kathy Harrison. And she wrote a book on Pickett's division <coughs> called Nothing But Glory. And I took this excerpt from it. And I've always uh, admired the book. I've always uh, thought a lot of it. He, she said this about the Virginians. They held from every part of Virginia, these men that were on this field. They came from places like Walton's Mill, Haymarket, Aldi, Dumfries, Buffalo Springs, Chestnut Fork, Prospect Hill, Cascade, Botetot Springs, and scores of other smaller communities, and larger towns such as Lynchburg, Culpeper, Charles City Courthouse, Charlottesville, and Richmond. Her study concluded the vast majority of the soldiers were farmers, and those who claimed the distinction of planner outnumbered all other occupations by a combined two to one ratio. <laughs> Scattered among these farmers were clerks, carpenters, and merchants. And the smaller layers showed numbers of lawyers, teachers, 
students, laborers, millers, wheelwrights, and masons, along with tobacconists. <laughs> Some of you would make good tobacconists, as much as y'all smoke on my tours. <laughs> Sash makers, bakers, plumbers, salesmen, painters, printers, postmen, tanners, well and fence diggers, physicians, overseers, harness makers, barkeepers, auctioneers, and butchers. Their average age was between 22 and 25 years old. Mm -hmm. The youngest was perhaps 16 in Pickett's division and the oldest was 46. These are the men that are going to have to execute the command which Robert E. Lee is about to do to get them. They're the men that are standing here in these ranks along with the rest of those states I just named. And folks, they're scared. Do you think anybody on this field, ladies and gentlemen, it's all about the experience. Do you think anybody on this field wants to die? They don't want to die. They want it to be over. They all want it to be over. And they just want to go home. He wants it over. And he is not going to leave this field. Robert E. Lee is not going to leave this field until he pushes it one last time. Lieutenant Colonel Raleigh Martin of the 53rd Virginia said long after the war, the esprit de corps could not have been better. The men were in good physical condition, self-reliant and determined. Pickett's division had been in combat for years. They were in very good shape. They felt the gravity of the situation, for they knew well the metal of the foe in their front. They were serious and resolute, but not disheartened. None of the usual jokes common on the eve of battle were indulged in for every man felt his individual responsibility and realized that he had the most stupendous work of his life before him. Officers and men knew at what cost and at what risk the advance was to be made, but they had deliberately made up their minds to attempt it. I believe the general sentiment of the division was that they would succeed in driving the federal lines on what was their objective point. They knew that many very many would go down under the storm of shot and shell but which would greet them when their gray ranks were spread out to view. But it never occurred to them that disaster would come after they once placed their tattered banners upon the crest of Seminary Ridge. Standing on this field, though, is that one fervent wish. Maybe this time, this will be the last time. On this field, to show you how there's all different types of men on this field, was the 28th Virginia. And in his command, in the command was the father and a son about to go into combat. 41-year-old Captain Michael Peters Fassard and his son, his son Hezekiah. Most of you heathens don't know who Hezekiah is. You <laughs> <laughs> need to go home and do some reading. The captain had only recently lost his wife and other children. It's the only family he's got left. And they're about to go into combat. Now he's going to march into attack with his only remaining child. What do you think he's going through? Does he think about it? I don't know. I don't know how you deal with it. I got a 13-year-old boy. I, I can't imagine. And they doubted themselves, folks. <coughs> they did. These are not. This is what I'm trying to pound into y'all's heads right now. These are not robots. They're mortal. They're mortal. June Kimball from the 14th Tennessee said he played fiddle in the glee club for the regiment. You know, I'd love to have seen that. He was promoted for gallantry at Fredericksburg. This man has been on many a battlefield. He is no coward. Before the artillery opened, Kimball walked to the edge of the woods and looked across, and he did not like what he saw. Realizing just what was before me, quote, realizing just what was before me and the brave boys with me, and at one of the most serious moments in my life, 
I asked aloud the question, June Kimball, are you going to do your duty today? Kimball responded to his own question, I'll do it so help me God. Quote, all dread passed away, he later said. And from that moment to the close of that disastrous struggle, I retained my nerve. Walking back to his comrades in the woods, he was asked by his, the fellow soldiers what he had seen up there. Most of the soldiers never saw the field before they got out on it. And Kimball told them directly, boys, if we have to go, it will be hot for us, and we will have to do our best. All right. Robert E. Lee is just not going to allow them to march across this road, okay, or across this field, unguarded. What he is going to do is basically open up with the largest, one, one of the largest artillery bombardments. Everybody forgets about Fredericksburg for some reason. But one of the largest artillery bombardments of the war. Now, I was getting audited by my former supervisor. He'll deny this. If you go find him, he'll deny this. But I swear to you, this is what happened. In the old Psychorama Center, he came back to me and he says, Matt, you got too many guns out there. I said, well, how many guns are there, Mr. Hartwick? <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, and I'm telling you, that there are 147 cannons lined up on this field. Not 146 and not 148. That audit was 20 years ago, and every time I go out there, it's 147 cannons. Beyond a doubt. I didn't get it first. I'd like to say something. Uh, you know, we get a lot of uh, movie stars <laughs> sometimes. I guess officially it was with the logistics. <laughs> right through here. Okay, real fast, folks. Uh, Pick his charge, as I said, to rehash what we had here. I've got I've got them lined up and positioned like they would have been here on the field. You're still right? setting up, right? You're setting up right now? Let's roll now. I'll back up. All right. Okay, we're on the edge. I'm sorry I didn't tip you off, and I just threw the cameraman off. All right, so we're lined up right now, and I'm about to show you the deployment of all the brigades that were involved in Pick his charge. So let's go at it. Let's see how good Matt's memory is uh, right here. Uh, this nice lady right here would be James Kemper's brigade. And he would have been located all the way down basically his right flank. Hold out your right arm. Just stick it out right there. His right flank, the right flank of the Confederate assault, would have been all the way down at the Sherfee farm. Basically at the Peach Orchard. Most people don't realize it went that far. Uh, this gentleman right here is Mr. Cal Ripken, otherwise known as Richard Garnett. Richard Garnett would have been positioned right in front of you. If there's one thing that surprised me, ladies and gentlemen, when I got here to Gettysburg and started studying this battle as a historian, I had read about Gettysburg a thousand times uh, through the course of, of my own you know, hobby, and it just blew my mind that, that Garnett's brigade was not here where we are, it was out there on that first rise. That's where the Confederate infantry, at least this brigade and this brigade, are going to be on that ridge line right out there. Now you start to see what Robert E. Lee is thinking. Now, from here, oh, and back here, none other. <laughs> Lewis Armistead. Got a little bit too much hair. <laughs> but this is old Lou Armistead. Armistead is in that wood line right behind you. And they would have been cocked back there. So, Kemper, Garnett, Armistead, back here in these woods to your left rear. My nephew right here. All right? This would be Burkett Fry's Brigade of Tennessee and Alabamians. 
This would be the one that June Kimball was in that I read you the quote from before. They would have been right over there in that first little line, that first little smidget of woods, that point of woods which you see right there. That would be basically, they'd be following that fence line where if you can see that kid coming in the yellow shirt running down, his mama's trying to catch him right now. <laughs> run, old rabbit, run. <laughs> and the rabbit jumped out of the bushes and took off real with him. And one of the soldiers looked after him and hollered, run, old hare. If I was old hare, I'd run too. <laughs> sure, sure, it wasn't all valor. <laughs> right here, we have the former brigade until July 3rd. On July 2nd, it was under the command of James J. Pettigrew. And by July 3rd, it was under the command of Colonel Marshall. Fry, Marshall. Hello. Joseph Davis, Mississippians and North Carolinians. You know your history? Yep. You're not going to like this. <laughs> okay, you're Brockenbrook. <laughs> All right, well, that's the way it goes. That's what you are. If you know your Gettysburg history, you know he's not going. To, you don't have to work too hard. All right. <laughs> All right, if I get you to step over here, don't borrow one of you. Stand behind him, you stand behind her, right through there, and don't shoot me with that pistol. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Duel of Honor. Tremble's division, formerly under Pender, who was mortally wounded the day before. That's how things are flying. Isaac Tremble came into Pennsylvania without a command, but he expected a vacancy to open up. And by God, one did. And he irritated Robert E. Lee and Richard Ewell so much that they gave him one just to shut him up. His two brigades, Lane and Lawrence, on July 3rd are going to be comprised by these two gentlemen right here. In a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, going back to the whole theme of this program, put yourself in the shoes of these men, of these leaders. Look at this formation which you have right here. Oh, and I forgot. Lexi and Laney, ladies and gentlemen, are comprised of Wilcox's Alabamians and David Lang's Floridians. All total, if you include these two brigades, which are small, <laughs> based on the losses that were yesterday, uh, on their previous day, when they had attacked the same position, Robert E. Lee has approximately 13,000 men in this line. Now, if you can see, if you can watch from here, look at the brigade formation. Where's the weakness of the line? Where's the weakness? Where's there a lack of depth to it? The lack of depth is the flanks. The weakness to the line is all the way over where you see that distant wood line in that area. There is nobody right here. Okay? They don't have anybody over here. They have two brigades in front and over here. Now these, this is going to come back to haunt them, the way that the formation was set up. Attack began. He looked out among these troops, and these from Heath's division, now under Pettigrew, had been in combat two days before. And they were putting in the 2nd Mississippi, I'll give you an example of why these men shouldn't have been in this attack. In the 2nd Mississippi, they stripped the, they stripped the litter bears and the cooks and gave them rifles just to fill out the ranks. Normally you don't do that. That is only in desperate situations. And when Lee rode the line, he looked at, he didn't, apparently he didn't know the condition. He should have known. A criticism, valid criticism of Lee. <laughs> Nobody got that joke. Okay, so. It's a lightning joke. Okay, okay never mind. It'd be one way to go, wouldn't it? See Stephen Lang and then watch me go. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert E. Lee. <laughs> Robert E. Lee rides that line. He says these men shouldn't have been here. Some of them should go to the rear is what he exactly says. These men should go to the rear. But it's too late. It's too late. The cannonade is underway. And there is no more shifting of these troops. As soon as it began, it almost certainly just ended. 
and as the fire slackened off to go back to where we left at the last spot George Pickett is going to come riding up to James Longstreet and he's going to ride up to him and he says he'll present him that note that I described to you from Alexander and he will ask his commander the fateful question, General, shall I advance? And Longstreet doesn't say anything. Now the only account we have of that, ladies and gentlemen, is from James Longstreet. I'm doing this for you Gettysburg buffs right now. I cannot base this on anything but conjecture, but I, I wouldn't be telling you this unless I thought I was right about it. Longstreet l writes that it, and it seems from his writing that Pickett came up and he sat there and debated it a moment and then turned away and gave him permission. I think that Longstreet took a lot longer than that. I think Pickett stood there for several minutes. I couldn't give you the exact minute, and I don't know how many times he came back. But Longstreet, who was in overall command of all these brigades, even Lena and Lexi <laughs> over here, he didn't want to do it. James Longstreet, in order to, in charge of this assault, the faithful, the lives of these men, I don't blame him. I don't cast any aspersions on him for not wanting to do it. That's actually a pretty smart idea on his part. But nevertheless, you have a man in command that doesn't want to do it. And you know your work usually reflects your attitude about the matter, so to speak. I think he stands there. But eventually Longstreet will give the permission. He'll give it the nod if you believe Longstreet's account. And Pickett will salute him. And then they will bring up a big horse. Nobody likes this Stephen Lang joke. Okay, so. <laughs> that rares a lot. <laughs> but Pickett will go out, and right here, where we're standing, you would have seen him. He took his hat off, and Pickett had these long, flowing, natural curls. Oh, he was a Jim Dandy. And in an army of stinking men, he kept them perfumed. Always smelling good. In an army of dirty men, Pickett always had a white shirt. Oh, yes. Stephen Lang, I, I always picture Pickett. Lang was with that laugh that Lang has when he portrayed him right there. I can picture Pickett doing that. Pickett rides out in front of his men and he says, Up, men, and to your post, and let no man forget today that you were from old Virginia. One, two, three. Yeah!